One month before the Watergate burglars went on trial, a 737 crashed in Chicago. Among the dead was Dorothy Hunt, wife of Watergate burglar Howard Hunt. Her purse, found in the wreckage, contained $10,000 in cash. Later, it would be revealed that Mrs. Hunt had acted as a courier, delivering money drawn from secret White House funds, hush money used to buy the burglars' silence. From the moment they were caught, the burglars lied to conceal their ties to the White House. Questioned by the FBI, G. Gordon Liddy, who'd planned the burglary, and James McCord, former CIA agent who'd helped to carry it out, insisted they had acted on their own. So did the president's men. Nixon's campaign manager and former attorney general, John Mitchell, who had approved the break-in, denied responsibility. The president's chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, authorized hush money payments totaling more than $350,000. The president's domestic advisor, John Ehrlichman, lied to the FBI and grand jury investigating the break-in. The president's counsel, John Dean, withheld evidence, coached witnesses, and monitored the FBI investigation. The cover-up was holding, but by early 73, it was consuming the time and attention of Nixon's closest aides, Haldeman and Ehrlichman. By February, John Dean had assumed more responsibility for managing the cover-up. He began to meet frequently with the president. When I first started dealing with the president, my first concern was whether I should even be dealing with him on this, because I felt that not only had I been compromised, I thought Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, all of us had, because by now I didn't have to be a criminal lawyer. I knew we were in the midst of something bad. I mean, this is a cover-up. There is no doubt in my mind. Nixon noted in his diary, I'm glad that I'm talking to Dean now, rather than going through Haldeman or Ehrlichman. I think I've made a mistake in going through others when there is a man with the capability of Dean I can talk to directly. Both Nixon and Dean sensed growing danger from Capitol Hill. The Senate, under Democratic leadership, was forming a special Watergate committee to investigate the break-in and the conduct of Nixon's re-election campaign. But the most immediate threat came from Watergate burglar Howard Hunt. Despairing over the death of his wife, concerned over the fate of his children, he now demanded $120,000. Or he would reveal, he said, the seamy things he had done for the Nixon White House. This is the first time one of these threats had ever been brought directly to me. And I didn't like being in that role, because I had never, I had, I knew about the money out there, but I'd never been a conveyor of messages back and forth. And now suddenly I'm just right in the middle of another ugly side of this. Hunt's demand was a turning point for John Dean. The White House could no longer control the cover-up. On March 21st, the worried Dean tried to persuade Nixon to end the conspiracy. He described the cover-up as a cancer on the presidency and warned that Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Dean himself had broken the law. And he did, the president started knocking down every one of these, these horribles I kept raising. Finally, I got around to saying, well, you know, these guys want a lot more money and uh, uh, to, to remain quiet. And, and uh, you know, just, you know, no tell me how much they want. And he said, well, how much could they want? And I pulled out a thin air, what I thought was a pretty astronomical number. And I said, well, it could cost a million dollars. Well, he looked at me and he said, John, I know where we'd get a million dollars. Nixon approved more hush money. He let the cover-up continue. Two days later, the cover-up blew wide open. Good evening. There was a major break in the Watergate trial today. On this day of sentencing, one of the defendants, James McCord, promised to uh, reveal hidden details about the bugging of the Democratic headquarters. In a letter to the judge presiding at the trial, James McCord admitted that the Watergate burglars had not acted on their own. His testimony implicated the White House and galvanized the national press. Even before McCord's letter, Nixon had ordered John Dean to write a report that would exonerate the White House of wrongdoing. 
The president asked him to reduce his understanding of the whole problem to writing. Um, his, he, he asked him to do that four or five times, and nothing happened. And finally, the president sent John Dean to Camp David in the middle of March uh, to sit down, do nothing, but write a report for the president on what this Watergate business was all about, who was involved, who was at fault, all of that. While Dean was up there, he had an epiphany, uh, which was that he was in deep trouble, or so he says. Well, it was clear, it was much clearer after the fact, but I suspected at the time I was being set up. And the whole plan was to give the president this, this report so he could say, this is all I've ever known. And my counsel lied to me, clearly. And, uh, and I just it wasn't made part of that. The cover-up was disintegrating, and Dean feared that he might become Nixon's scapegoat. In early April, he telephoned Haldeman to say that he was talking with the prosecutors. Haldeman cautioned him, I think you ought to think about it, because once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's hard to get it back in. If Dean is totally out of control, Ehrlichman told Nixon, you could get an article of impeachment. Haldeman later remembered that Nixon looked stunned. In private, the president continued to search for a scapegoat and struggled to salvage the cover-up. In public, he acted as if he were upholding the law. I can report today that there have been major developments in the case concerning which it would be improper to be more specific now, except to say that real progress has been made in finding the truth. I condemn any attempt cover up in this case, no matter who is involved. Thank you. Events were spinning out of Nixon's control. John Dean, bargaining for immunity with Watergate prosecutor Earl Silbert, made a stunning revelation. Dean's lawyer said, Dean has one more thing to tell you that you might want to know about. And uh, Dean at that point said, we are standing in the hallway and Dean is in, in the office, he said, uh, in substance, sir, that uh, Liddy and Hunt uh, were involved in a break-in into the office of Ellsberg's uh, psychiatrist, Dan Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Uh, that was, I, I know my jaw must have fallen down to the floor. I mean, that was a, uh, a bombshell of, of information. For two years, the burglary of Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office had remained one of the most closely guarded secrets of the Nixon White House. Now Dean's revelation suggested that the Watergate break-in was not an isolated event. It was part of a web of illegal activities ordered by the president's men. Vacationing in Key Biscayne, Nixon knew Dean had talked to the prosecutors. But he still hoped to appeal to Dean's loyalty not to reveal any more. On Easter Sunday, Nixon called Dean. He said he'd been out with the family to Easter Sunday or what have you. And he said, I want you to know, John, you're still my counsel. And I thought to myself, B.S., you know, this is, he, I'm about as close to being his counsel now as, as uh, the man on the moon. And it was just, he just was keeping little feelers out there. And, uh, but I made it pretty clear to, to, to all, the, all the word I was putting back to everybody. I, you know, I wasn't making any deals. I wasn't interested in any deals. I think he, I think Nixon hoped that he could make a bargain with Dean and say, in effect, you have to protect your president. Uh, but the much stronger voice that Dean was hearing uh, was the uh, prosecutor saying, boy, I'm going to nail you to the wall unless you give me all the dirt. As Dean and other aides scrambled for immunity, rumors swirled about the White House, coming ever closer to the Oval Office. In April, accusations against Haldeman and Ehrlichman dominated the headlines. The two men had protected the president, guarded his privacy, shared his ambitions. But now Nixon would sacrifice his closest aides. The last Sunday in April, he summoned them to Camp David. The first thing he said to me was, when I went to sleep last night, I prayed that I would not wake up this morning. And uh, 
he began to, to uh, really cry. He began to really cry, and I didn't know what to do. I, I had just never seen him out of control this way. Uh, he finally said, basically, I, I, the words have gone, I've forgotten. I went back and made very careful notes so that somewhere I have notes of this conversation. But the gist of it was that the accusations were uh, so serious that um, he, he couldn't keep us on. He thought maybe we could stay on, Bob and I, as uh, on a leave of absence or some such form. But he saw that, that he had to uh, cut it off that he was going to fire Dean at the same time, he was going to fire the Attorney General at the same time. At, at some point, he, he asked me if there was anything that he could do for me. I said, yeah, I'd like you to explain this all to my kids, because I'm having trouble explaining to them why you would do this. And uh, he didn't, didn't respond to that. So we ended up in a hug. We hugged each other, and... Uh, I could see that he had said everything that he could, and, and that was the end of it. In May, the President and Mrs. Nixon welcomed the returning POWs to the White House. It is always the custom at a dinner at the White House to have a toast to the honored guests. The difficulty tonight is that there are so many honored guests that uh, we would be drinking all night and into the day. Somebody just said, what's wrong with that? <laughs> New Watergate charges were erupting daily, but the POWs remained loyal to their commander-in-chief. And sir, I would like to state for all of us that we never lost faith in your integrity or your courage, and we are proud to be citizens of the United States. But the public's faith in the president would soon be severely tested. The Senate Watergate Committee began hearings that would keep the nation spellbound throughout the summer. The historic caucus room was jammed today with cameras, newsmen, 200 seated spectators, and more standing. This room has been the scene of... One of the largest audiences in television history watched on May 17th as Senator Sam Irvin opened the investigation of Nixon's re-election campaign and the Watergate break-in. The committee will come to order. The questions that have been Even the president's staff watched as a parade of witnesses implicated Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and others high in the administration and the Nixon campaign. But in the first month of testimony, the president himself escaped direct charges of wrongdoing. Then the committee summoned its star witness, John Dean. In a seven-hour opening statement, Dean described the atmosphere of the Nixon White House. The Watergate matter was an, an inevitable outgrowth of a climate of excessive concern over the political impact of demonstrators, excessive concern over leaks, an insatiable appetite for political intelligence, all coupled with a do-it-yourself White House staff, regardless of the law. He spoke in almost a monotone as he began to tell some of the most outrageous stories about what had occurred. And coming from a monotone, it was the facts rather than his personality uh, that uh, came out of the public. Dean described his meeting on March 21st when he warned Nixon about the burglars' escalating demands. I told the president about the fact that there was no money to pay these individuals to meet their demands. He asked me how much it would cost. I told him I could only make an estimate that it might be as high is a million dollars or more. He told me that that was no problem. He also looked over at Haldeman and repeated the same statement. That story came out. It was the very first time in the hearing, the very first time any evidence came forward that really put the president in on the obstruction of justice. The president who said he knew nothing about these things. The president who said he had started an investigation to find out who was involved. And here was a eyewitness, a person who was involved, who was testifying to the president's very deep involvement in the obstruction of justice and the cover-up. It was now the word of the president against his 34-year-old former counsel. The White House tried to undermine Dean's testimony by spreading rumors about his credibility and character. 
With no way to determine who was telling the truth, Nixon believed he would prevail. Then on July 16th, everything changed for Richard Nixon. My name is Alexander Porter Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. And so that if either Mr. Dean, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Colson had particular meetings in the Oval Office with the President on any particular dates that had been testified before this committee, there would be a tape recording with the President of that full conversation, would there not? Yes, sir. One last question. If one were, therefore, to reconstruct the conversations at any particular date, what would be the best way to reconstruct those conversations, Mr. Butterfield? Well, in the obvious manner, Mr. Dash, to obtain the tape and play it. I have no further questions. Nixon was in the hospital with viral pneumonia when he learned about Butterfield's testimony. He wrote on a bedside pad, should have destroyed the tapes after April 30th. Nixon knew controlling the tapes was the key to his survival. He would appeal to historical precedent and argue that the tapes were like presidential papers. They belonged to the president, not to Congress or the courts. The president had a right to keep them private. The battle for the tapes began with the president rallying the White House staff. I was rather amused by some very well-intentioned people who thought that, you know, some of the, the rather rough uh, assaults that any man in this office gets from time to time uh, brings on an illness and that uh, after going through such an illness that I might get so tired that uh, I would consider either slowing down or, uh, <laughs> or even some suggested resigning. Well, now, uh, just so we set that to rest, I want to use a phrase that my Ohio father used to use. That's just plain poppycock. We're going to stay on this job till we get the job done. And let others wallow in Watergate. We're going to do our job. The continuing investigations placed new pressures on the White House. The Watergate committee issued a subpoena for the president's tapes. Nixon refused to comply and risked being found in contempt of Congress. But even that was not his biggest concern. Pressured by Congress, Attorney General Elliot Richardson agreed to appoint an independent special prosecutor. He chose Archibald Cox and gave him sweeping powers to investigate the Nixon White House. What if this trail leads into the Oval Office at the White House? Well, as I replied then, uh, the trail should be followed wherever it leads. Thank you, John. Thank you. Nixon later described Cox as the partisan viper we had planted in our bosom. We saw Archie Cox in political rather than legal terms. He was sort of the high guru of the Kennedy government in waiting in Cambridge. And the idea that these Kennedy and McGovern political operatives were going to be demanding to run barefoot through all the most private files of the of Nixon White House was utterly appalling and absolutely outrageous. Cox and his staff requested sensitive White House files. Nixon reluctantly complied. Cox also demanded nine of the president's tapes. Nixon refused. Cox took his case to court. As I've said before, I'm sure that the president's legal position is presented in good faith. I think it's quite wrong. By the end of summer, Nixon's refusal to turn over the tapes and John Dean's testimony had badly eroded the public's support for the president. But after months of unrelenting press coverage, Nixon sensed that Americans were growing weary of Watergate. He moved to take the offensive. For the first time in 14 months, Nixon held a televised news conference and tried to turn the persistent questioning to his advantage. At any time during the Watergate crisis, did you ever consider resigning? 
And would you consider resigning if you felt that your capacity to govern has been seriously weakened? And in that connection, how much do you think your capacity to govern has been weakened? The answer to the first two questions is no. The answer to the third question is that uh, it is true that as far as uh, the capacity to govern is concerned, uh, that to be under a constant barrage uh, 12 to 15 minutes a night on each of the three major networks uh, for four months uh, tends to raise some questions in the people's mind with regard to the president, and it may raise some questions with regard to the capacity to govern. The point that I make now is that we are proceeding as best we know how to get all those guilty brought to justice in Watergate. But now we must move on from Watergate to the business of the people. And the business of the people is continuing with the initiatives we began the first administration. Just a moment. We've had 30 minutes of this press conference. I have yet to have, for example, one question on the business of the people, which shows you our, how we're consumers. I'm not criticizing the members. But events overwhelmed the president's counteroffensive. In a scandal unrelated to Watergate, Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, was under investigation for bribery, tax evasion, and extortion. Uh, gentlemen, I believe you've all received copies of the prepared statement that I read to the court. On October 10th, Agnew pled no contest to tax evasion and resigned. Agnew's departure made Nixon more vulnerable. Unlike Agnew, his new vice president and potential successor was popular with Republicans and Democrats alike. Our distinguished guests and our, my fellow Americans, I proudly present to you the man whose name I will submit to the Congress of the United States for confirmation as the Vice President of the United States, Congressman Gerald Ford of Michigan. On Capitol Hill, Gerald Ford was already seen as a viable alternative to the president himself. That same day, the Court of Appeals ruled that Nixon must yield the tapes to special prosecutor Archibald Cox. But Nixon saw the ruling as an opportunity for a showdown with Cox. He made an offer he thought would sound reasonable to the public, but that he was certain Cox would reject. Nixon would turn over summaries of the tapes, but not the tapes themselves. And he ordered Cox not to ask for any more material. As Nixon expected, Cox refused. This is Jim Doyle from Archibald Cox's office. I have a long statement. Are you ready? In my judgment, the president is refusing to comply with the court decrees. I think it is my duty uh, to bring to the court's attention uh, what seems to me to be non-compliance with the court order. Within hours, Nixon ordered Elliot Richardson to fire Archibald Cox. But Nixon had miscalculated. Richardson refused. And he said, you realize, Elliot, that Brezhnev may conclude that I'm losing control of my own administration. But I said, Mr. President, I am committed to the independence of the special prosecutor. For me to have acquiesced in this being fired would be a total betrayal of that commitment. He said, I'm sorry that you choose to prefer your purely personal commitments to the national interest. Mustering all my self-control, I, I said in as level a voice as I could, Mr. President, it would appear that we have a different assessment of the national interest. The events that followed became known as the Saturday Night Massacre. Good evening. The country tonight is in the midst of what may be the most serious constitutional crisis in its history. The president has fired the special Watergate prosecutor, Archibald Cox. Because of the president's action, the attorney general has resigned. Elliot Richardson has quit, saying he cannot carry out Mr. Nixon's instructions.
Richardson's deputy, William Ruckelshaus, has been fired. Ruckelshaus refused in a moment of constitutional drama to obey a presidential order to fire the special Watergate prosecutor. And half an hour after the special Watergate prosecutor had been fired, agents of the FBI, acting at the direction of the White House, sealed off the offices of the special prosecutor, the offices of the attorney general, and the offices of the deputy attorney general. Six FBI agents present, impeding our operations right now. All of this adds up to a totally unprecedented situation, a grave and profound crisis in which the president has set himself against his own attorney general and the Department of Justice. Nothing like this has ever happened before. More than 50,000 telegrams poured in on Capitol Hill today. So many, Western Union was swamped. Most of them demanded impeaching Mr. Nixon. These come from Republicans and businessmen and people, most of whom uh, begin their statement by saying, I've supported the president, I've never believed in impeachment, but he's now gone too far and uh, we're going to have to, we want the Congress to take strong action. In my three district offices in the one Republican area, my phone calls were 100 to 1 in favor of pursuing the path of impeachment, which was rather shocking to me. I was terribly surprised, which says something about that, uh, that very weird thing that happens when you're in the middle of a cocoon, of a crisis within a protected environment, and you have a great desire for things to happen as you want them to happen. On Tuesday, Nixon learned that 21 resolutions calling for his impeachment had been introduced on Capitol Hill. Stunned by the ferocity of the public reaction, Nixon retreated. He appointed a new special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski, and agreed to release the nine subpoenaed tapes. But two tapes turned out to be missing. The White House said they never existed. A third tape contained an 18 and a half minute gap. The erased section was a conversation between the president and H.R. Haldeman three days after the break-in. The president's counsel, Fred Bizart, explained the gap to a skeptical press. You now believe it could be accidental? Yes. How? The White House claimed that the president's secretary, Rosemary Woods, had accidentally erased the tape while transcribing it. Is that logical? for that to happen accidentally. Uh, I mean, is that well, believable? Yes. Questions now arose about every aspect of the president's life. Campaign contributions, taxes, friendships, vacation homes. Everything seemed fair game. The president struggled to defend himself against assaults that came from all sides. I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistake. But in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've burned everything I've got. In March 1974, Nixon went to the Grand Old Opry, to the South, where his support remained the strongest. In the end, he later wrote, it would come down to a campaign, but this time I would be campaigning for my political life. If you'll join us in this song, I think you'll recognize it when I start. Let me get a coin. But seven of Nixon's closest aides had been indicted by the Watergate grand jury. And the aftershocks of the Saturday Night Massacre continued to reverberate in the courts and in Congress.
On Capitol Hill, the House Judiciary Committee was debating Nixon's impeachment, investigating charges ranging from illegal wiretaps and break-ins to abuse of power and obstruction of justice. Pursuing their investigations, they demanded more tapes and set a deadline of April 30th. On April 29th, with less than 24 hours to go, facing a citation for contempt of Congress, Nixon tried to do again what had worked so well for him in the past, bypass his opponents and appeal directly to the public. Good evening. I have asked for this time tonight in order to announce my answer to the House Judiciary Committee's subpoena for additional Watergate tapes. In these folders that you see over here on my left, are more than 1,200 pages of transcripts of private conversations. I Nixon announced he was releasing edited transcripts of the tapes to the committee and the public simultaneously. The president himself had supervised the editing. In giving you these records, blemishes and all, I am placing my trust in the basic fairness of the American people. Nixon had gambled and lost. He badly misjudged the public reaction. The transcripts, said Time magazine, showed a president creating an environment of deceit and dishonesty, of evasion and cover-up. Even Republican leaders denounced them as shabby, disgusting, immoral. A majority of Americans now thought the president should resign or face impeachment. Soon after the transcripts were delivered to Capitol Hill, the Judiciary Committee voted that the president had failed to comply with their subpoena. They continued to demand the tapes. In the White House, Nixon secluded himself, listening to the recordings over and over. Not only was Congress demanding the tapes, so was the new special prosecutor. Nixon had exhausted all his legal appeals but one. He took his case to the Supreme Court. It would become known as the United States versus Richard Nixon. As his lawyers prepared to argue his case, the president took his campaign abroad, hoping to build on the diplomatic triumphs of the past first to the Middle East, where just months before his persistent diplomacy had helped bring about a fragile peace between Arabs and Israelis. Then to the Soviet Union, where the glittering ceremonies mirrored the president's past success. But the summit achieved little. Leonid Brezhnev sensed that Nixon's power was eroding fast. Returning home, Nixon landed at a small Air Force base in Maine, where the military crowd gave him a warm welcome. But the extraordinary journey that had taken Richard Nixon all the way from Yorba Linda to the White House, to Peking and Moscow, from humiliating defeats to the pinnacle of world power, seemed to be coming to an end. Most Americans had lost faith in the president. They saw a man who had repeatedly lied to cover up his crimes, had subverted the political process and undermined the Constitution. There are frightening implications for the future of our country if we do not impeach the President of the United States. If we fail to impeach, we have condoned and left unpunished a course of conduct totally inconsistent with the reasonable expectations of the American people. On Capitol Hill, the Judiciary Committee prepared to vote on three articles of impeachment. They charged the president with obstruction of justice, abuse of power, and contempt of Congress. The thing that's so appalling to me is that the president, when this whole idea was suggested to him, didn't in righteous indignation rise up and say, get out of here, you're in the office of the president of the United States. How can you talk about blackmail and bribery and keeping witnesses silent? This is the presidency of the United States. But my president didn't do that. He sat there 
And he worked and worked to try to cover this thing up so it wouldn't come to light. The committee took its first vote July 27th. Nixon was swimming at San Clemente as they rendered their verdict. Signified by saying aye, all those opposed, no. Mr. Flower. Aye. Mr. Mann. Aye. Mr. Greinen. Aye. Nixon later wrote, I was getting dressed in the beach trailer when the phone rang and Ziegler gave me the news. That was how I learned that I was the first president in 106 years to be recommended for impeachment. Standing in the beach trailer, barefoot, wearing old trousers, Van Lawn shirt, and a blue windbreaker emblazoned with the presidential seal. No. Mr. Rodino. Aye. 27 members have voted aye. 11 members have voted no. And pursuant to the resolution, Article 1, that resolution is adopted and will be reported to the House. Just days before, the Supreme Court had ruled in the case of the United States versus Richard Nixon. The president must turn over the tapes to the special prosecutor. Not even a president, said the court, could withhold evidence in a criminal trial. Nixon returned to Washington, still calculating the odds. He knew the House of Representatives would vote to indict him. There was a chance he might survive a trial in the Senate, as long as there was no irrefutable evidence that he had personally committed a crime. But Nixon himself possessed that evidence, a tape that plainly showed he'd obstructed justice. His conversation with H.R. Haldeman on June 23, 1972, when Nixon ordered his aides to divert the FBI. Nixon would soon have to release this tape, along with others covered by the Supreme Court ruling. With nothing left to lose, he decided to release a transcript of the tape. It became known as the smoking gun. The night following the release of the transcript, Nixon sat alone in the Lincoln sitting room, then retired to bed. His daughter, Julie, had left a note on his pillow. The White House, August 6th. Dear Daddy, I love you. Whatever you do, I will support. I'm very proud of you. Go through the fire just a little bit longer. You're so strong. I love you. Millions support you. Julie. On August 8th, Nixon announced he would address the nation. Outside the White House, crowds gathered, watching, waiting. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. On August 9th, the president bid farewell to the White House staff. You are here to uh, say goodbye to us. And uh, we don't have a good word for it in English. Uh, the best is au revoir. We'll see you again.
had a little quote in a speech last night from T.R. As you know, I kind of like to read books. I'm not educated, but I do read books. <laughs> and uh, there's another one I found as I was reading my last night in the White House. And this quote is about a young man. It was a young lawyer in New York. He'd married a beautiful girl. And they had a lovely daughter. And then suddenly, she died. And this is what he wrote. This was in his diary. He said, she was beautiful in face and form and lovelier still in spirit. As a flower, she grew, and as a fair young flower, she died. And when my heart's dearest died, <clears throat> died the light went from my life forever. That was T.R. <clears throat> in his 20s. He thought the life had gone from his life forever, but he went on. And he not only became president, but as an ex-president, he served his country always in the arena, tempestuous, strong, sometimes wrong, sometimes right. But he was a man. It's only a beginning, always. The young must know it. The old must know it. Because the greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you. Those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. On September 8, 1974, President Gerald Ford granted Richard Nixon a full and absolute pardon. Over 70 others were found guilty of criminal acts and punished. The contradictions of Nixon's career, his triumphs and defeats, grand vision and petty grievances, have left their imprint on America. But his legacy remains ambiguous. The judgment of history, Nixon has said, depends on who writes it.